Hello everyone, uh, my name is Valentina Cantori and I'm an MPAC fellow working on the Master Seed project. Welcome to our MPAC Instagram Live. Today I'm here with Salam al Marayati, who is the president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and we're here to talk about Jordan Peterson's address uh, to Muslims that circulated a couple of weeks ago uh, and that um, basically um, critiqued um, Muslim communities for not engaging uh, in interfaith dialogues and in building bridges of understanding uh, with other faiths and also um, uh, invited uh, Muslims to try to uh, kind of close the divide between Sunni and Shia uh, in Muslim majority countries. And uh, we wanted to have this space to talk about this address because, uh, first of all, we uh, at MPAC have done a lot uh, on both fronts. And so we would love to talk about that and make it um, known um, that there are efforts out there to uh, both engage uh, Christian and Jews and to close the divide between Sunni and Shia, both in the United States and abroad, uh, and also um, because uh, we wanted to engage in a discussion and see what are the problems, why there are perceptions out there uh, that Muslims are uh, not willing to engage in this kind of conversations. So, Salam, yeah. welcome to Thank this you. space. Thank you, Valentina. And just to clarify in terms of Valentina's work, Mustard Seed is the project that we have with evangelical communities, and I just came from an evangelical conference. Uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, that was sponsored by One American Movement. So the basic response to people like Dr. Peterson is, we've actually, we actually are doing the things that he is suggesting, and rather than talk about Muslims, we would prefer if he talked to Muslims, to be in, in serious conversation, so that we can actually do some work rather than just you know, throw political grenades at each other uh, and comment on international events that are outside of our control as if it's the you know, responsibility of the Muslim community the, to control what's happening um, you know, um, 10,000 miles away. That is not the responsibility of Christians when something happens overseas, not the responsibility of Jews, Hindus, anybody else. But it just seems that when it, comes, when it involves Muslims, then there's that collective guilt that is thrown at our community. So there was a visceral, re visceral reaction to his vi uh, video message, the, you know, you people message that he gave uh, about uh, message, what was called message to Muslims. And then there are some real issues that we do have to deconstruct uh, on interfaith relations, intrafaith relations, uh, Muslims and political culture, Muslims and controlling uh, the narrative about Islam and Muslims in media. So those are serious issues and we would have preferred to have a conversation with Dr. Peterson, but you know, he's obviously too busy and too popular <laughs> right now to have a talk with us little people. But it's the little people that actually do the work. Yeah, we are actually indeed, as Salam was mentioning, doing the work. We have uh, been engaging with um, evangelical communities in partnership with the One America movement uh, to try to bridge the divide and to close the polarization that they're witnessing in the United States. And we're perfectly aware of the fact that there might be uh, situations in which, um, you know, there is the need to push for more interfaith dialogue. But at the same time, um, I think one of the issues with uh, Jordan Peterson's address uh, to Muslims was uh, the overgeneralization that is always somewhat problematic. Um, and and I think, you know, MPAC has done uh, throughout the years, um, since its inception, actually, so much work in trying to debunk this image of Islam and Muslims as monolithic. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, seeing after so many years of work that uh, there's still personalities that are public personalities out there uh, that, um, that engage and sustain these monolithic representations of Muslims as being unwilling to engage, uh, uh, in interfaith efforts uh, as, you know, somewhat having, you know, a kind of divisive gene is so problematic. And so that's why we need to step out and step up and, and say something. And um, I am no Muslim, actually, but I've had so much experience with Muslim communities in my lifetime. Um, I come from Italy, uh, where I uh, wrote my very first um, dissertation, like uh, thesis on uh, Islam in Italy, and I've lived extensively Muslim majority mm. countries so I have um, I have experience with these communities and so I, I know on um, you know kind of a very anecdotal personal from my personal experience how uh, diverse uh, the realm of uh, is 
Islam in the world is, how different each local national situation is and how, you know, we need to be really to be careful to have this broad brush statements about what Muslims do uh, because we don't have uh, the capacity to make these statements and they are mostly wrong. Um, yeah, and we don't apply that to other faiths. This is not done to Christianity and Christians. It's not done to Judaism and Jews. You know, when something happens in Israel, we don't go to the Jewish community and say, you know, you have to do A, B, and C or, or otherwise. Um, and, and for Christians, you know, people use Christianity uh, for some of the worst things, uh, you know, in terms of violating the reproductive rights of women um, and criminal, the criminalization of women um, or what happened internationally against the Bosnians, the genocide in Bosnia committed by uh, Serbs that were invoking Christianity and the Orthodox Church uh, in, in Serbia was front and center on that issue. But we don't blame religion when those things happen. And there's that tendency to just blame the whole religion. They, and, and there was a person who did a study about that issue and said, yeah, people may like Muslims, but they still hate Islam in America. And they look at American Muslims as they don't know any better. They really don't know their religion. That's why they're peaceful. That's why they're uh, engaging. And we're saying just the opposite. It is Islam that makes us engaging. It is Islam that is demanding that we work for peace. It is Islam that we protect the rights of Jews and Christians as people of the book. It is Islam that is telling us to condemn what happened in New Mexico, uh, where the, the report is, is that it was because of anti-Shia rhetoric uh, and, and violence. And MPAC in 2007 produced the code of honor on intra-faith unity between Sunni and Shia leaders. Many people signed it. It was adopted by the city of Los Angeles in City Hall. And it was also um, a, a, a topic of conversation this week where yesterday we attended a memorial uh, on behalf of the victims in New Mexico. And we brought um, Sunni and, and Shia leaders to comment on it. We have a video, but uh, I'm not sure if it's going to get the same traction that uh, the Jordan Peterson video gets. But. Oh, we would make it viral. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, good. Yes, and I, I agree. And, and I think, you know, what, um, what is, you know, one of the problems um, is also losing track of the historical uh, origins of some of the uh, dynamics that we see that are not attached to any specific religious dictates or religious dogma. It's just that, you know, it's so easy sometimes to forget that some of the divisions that we experience and we see nowadays unfolding in the Middle East, for example, are uh, due to um, colonial European colonialism mm. and uh, American imperialism. Uh, and, you know, the, the UK had this, you know, colonial practice of what's called divide et impera, which is like the divide and conquer rationale yeah. that really formed groups and pitted groups against each other in order to um, to actually maintain colonial rule. And so I think, you know, again, these over generalizations are problematic because they lose track of, first of all, the role of Western countries in producing some of the tensions that we see nowadays unfolding in Middle Eastern countries and all over the world, actually. Uh, and so uh, kind of puts the responsibility on Muslims to solve a problem that is very much historical and structural. Uh, and so we should really shift the terms in terms of how we talk about these problems. And it's, um, there is, there is uh, no single individual, uh, you know, th there's no way of kind of solving this problem by just uh, having individuals willing to. We really need to take responsibility and, and see how history unfolded and try to undo some of the bad that has been done and has created the conditions for these yeah. decisions to, to and, emerge. And no doubt there are bad actors uh, that are claiming to represent Islam. I mean, we just heard today about the Saman Rushdi attack. And um, if it is a Muslim and it is based on what happened uh, to take two decades ago or more uh, by the Ayatollah's fatwa against Saman Rushdi, which we condemned, we condemned the fatwa uh, because we, we, we are taught that Islam stands for freedom of expression. And so if it stands for freedom of expression, then we should allow people to insult our prophet and insult uh, our faith um, and we respond uh, in rhetoric. We don't respond with violence. Um, it's, it's, it becomes a debate. And in fact, the Quran documents the insults made against the Prophet. 
it says that they say this and that about you, that you are a, uh, you, you're a sorcerer, that you're a liar, that you just uh, are, are an opportun opportunist and things like that. None, in none of those verses did it tell the prophet or did it document that the prophet um, actually responded with violence. In fact, the Quran teaches us the opposite. It says, you can respond in rhetoric in kind, but it's better for you to be patient and to do good work. In other words, the good work is the real argument. People can debate theology all they want, and that's what turns people off, by the way, is when they see theologians debate uh, about which religion is better or which, which school of thought is better. Um, instead, they want to see the good work. They want to see us build institutions that help serve the needy, that help bridge the gap between the haves and the have-nots, that work for equity. As the Quran says, O oh, you who believe you've been established to promote uh, and defend uh, equity and justice and be witnesses to God, even if you have to testify against yourself or your parents or your family or your community. So the litmus test and the parameters of justice in Islam is to defend the rights of the other. And if we just followed the Quran and if Christians just followed the, the Bible and Jews just followed the Old Testament, it would be a much better world, uh, we believe. Yes, Salam, uh, we have uh, someone in the chat that is uh, asking what impact actually does as an organization. Uh, so do you wanna maybe say something in general about the sure. mission? So there are three aspects uh, of MPAC's work. One is to work on public policy. So we have a government relations office in Washington, D.C. that works on mainly national security policies that are targeting Muslims. And so we, uh, we work uh, to reform those policies in Washington, D.C. Uh, number two is our Hollywood Bureau. And we are, we're a resource for Hollywood to tell better stories about Muslims and to have Muslims control the narrative in Hollywood. And number three, uh, we develop young leaders. We provide support for young leaders to become the brain trust in Washington and Hollywood and New York and many areas where decisions and public opinions are shaped. So that's, that's impact, impact's work. And then we have the Master Seed Project, indeed, that is the one that uh, tries Project, to, right. yeah, it's connected to, to the policy work and also uh, the, the Hollywood work and really tries to um, change relationships. That, yeah, that we call our ground game. So we, that's where we go to communities and Mustard Seed is one of the community-based programs that talk about the policies and public opinion about Islam and Muslims and relations with others. So it's the, it's the actual manifestation uh, uh, of the work that we do in Washington and Hollywood. But I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. uh, Valentina, you know, you're from Italy and you, you, you've had experience with Muslim communities there. You've studied uh, Muslim communities based on your, your research. Um, and in terms of what Jordan Peterson said, you know, that, that criticism uh, uh, about Islam and Muslims, is that legitimate? I mean, should we... Should we accept the criticism and, and deal with it rather than, you know, look like we're just rejecting it? Um, I think, I, okay, so I think many things and I'll try to <laughs> go in order. So I think um, it was problematic uh, because uh, it reinforces, again, this idea that Muslims have to take responsibility. And, you know, I've seen, again, in my experience dealing with Muslims community, I've seen many uh, different positions and some more open, some more close to engaging. Uh, but this is true of every religious tradition. There is no kind of uh, monolithic way of dealing with uh, interfaith relationships. And so I'll tell you a story just to, to make the case of, I think, uh, why overgeneralizing is problematic and why we need more context also in understanding. So I lived for a summer in Jerusalem. Uh, I was studying Arabic there and uh, I was 21, so very young, and I was uh, trying to explore Palestine and Israel, but mm -hmm. I had no money because I was a poor student. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I uh, used to take lots of buses and uh, public transportation. And I went to Ramallah, which is on the northern part of Jerusalem. And, um, you know, usually tourists take the bus or the taxi to kind of cross uh, the checkpoint there, which is called Kalandia. Uh, and I didn't have the money to do so, so I crossed uh, on foot and I saw 
for example, the dire, the dire conditions in which uh, Palestinians were forced to live in their day uh, to day life. And so, um, you know, I met some Palestinians that were very uh, keen on engaging with Jews and some others that were not. And I think having had that personal experience of, you know, crossing Kalandeya by foot really helped me understand maybe why some um, some of the Palestinians I got to know in my life were not as prone to opening up to that, uh, that kind of dialogue. So mm. again, it's really about having not a monolithic perception and trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes and trying to understand um, you know, where people are coming from and what they bring to the table. And uh, I think, you know, in the case of, again, some of the Palestinians I, I met, um, you know, having been subject to uh, treatment in their daily life that was not, uh, you know, what I think any human being should deserve, like they were not as open to dialogue. Uh, but this doesn't mean that, you know, Islam is not open to dialogue or Muslims in general are not. And so again, I think the problem with Peterson's address was really like this overgeneralization. It's mm -hmm. not taking into consideration the circumstances that might lead um, to certain uh, openness or closeness on the part of the Muslim community. Yeah. Again, the diversity is so immense that we cannot ever use broad, you know, broad brush stroke, is that how you say broad English? Brush, right. Yeah, kind of um, right. uh, statement. Generalizing, um, you know, right. based on one incident, you generalize over a whole community, which is which happens, unfortunately, all the time. Right. Um, and it also leads to the other point that, you know, a lot of our policies in the Middle East, what, what, what is it doing? I mean, American taxpayers need to ask, why are we spending tax dollars to continue the military occupation of the Palestinian people. And then we wonder why there's anti-American sentiment. Why do they hate us? Uh, you know, you, because we're using tax dollars to occupy a people, uh, American tax dollars. Then there are wars, like what happened in Iraq. Um, you know, a complete destruction of that society with our tax dollars. And uh, basically Iraq uh, was in ruins and now they're trying to build it back brick by brick. Uh, and trying to create uh, a society which, before the first Gulf War, had an 85% literacy rate. Right. Um, and, and so all, all these things are happening in the Middle East, and we're, we're, we're turning uh, a blind eye to what's happening to the Syrian people, the atrocities. Now, the largest refugee uh, community in the world is coming from Syria, and uh, because we, we decided to not support uh, the, the people there and we sided with the dictator in maintaining the status quo. Uh, there is that devastation in Syria, Syria right now. The, the, the allies in the Middle East uh, are, are some of the most authoritarian uh, dictatorships we find uh, throughout the world. These are U.S. allies. So we have to start looking at our policy and we have to start looking at our national security policy. We spend about a trillion dollars a year on national security, but nobody feels secure. And uh, as one of the senators, I believe his name is Chris Smith, said, perhaps we should stop sending weapons to the Middle East, uh, thinking that that's going to make us more secure. Uh, the U.S. is the number one arms dealer in the world, uh, an arms supplier, uh, and yet we're wondering why there's so much war and so much violence. Well, they're using a lot of uh, American weapons uh, with that violence and with that devastation. Right, yes, it's definitely, again, you know, taking into account American imperialism when we try to understand, you know, um, sectarian strife in Middle Eastern country. Um, you know, even, you know, Islamist movements that have been, you know, the reason why the U.S. government has invested so much uh, money in the war of terror, on terror, um, have been created originally with thinkers that were, um, uh, you know, generated in the colonial era. Again, um, they were kind of reacting to the culture of uh, colonialism in Egypt, like Said Khot, think about mm -hmm. that, you know. So, um, so I think, again, it's too easy to just um, invite Muslims to engage in these conversations without really taking into account all this historical context and the structural problems that exist, including, you know, the, the on the one hand, the performance of saying we need to have more dialogue, etc., but on the other, the reality of, uh, you know, a Middle East that is um, uh, really uh, um, 
divided because of the um, kind of interventions of um, the United States in their local politics. Yeah. Uh, so we need to yeah. pay attention and, to that. And, you know, 1952, the Iranian people had a democratic, a democratically elected leader named Mohammad Mossadegh, um, and the CIA decided that he didn't serve American interests, and so they instigated a coup. Uh, there's a guy named General Schwarzkopf. His father was the leader of the, the coup at that time, uh, the, the one who instigated the coup. Uh, and then uh, the Shah of Iran was uh, reinstalled as the leader. That led to tyranny uh, until 1979, it led to the revolution, which is, of, of course, an anti-American uh, uh, campaign and anti-American revolution to this day. Uh, so there are roots uh, of rage that we can point to that should be part of the conversation. My, our point is stop blaming Islam and, and the religion. Uh, Islam actually created a great civilization. Uh, we, we benefited from that civil civilization in terms of the advancements in chemistry and math and science and culture and art and and so much the golden age of Spain that we keep talking about, read about in our history books. Well, unfortunately, a number of our high school students, many of them, if not all of them, that go to public school, don't have the privilege of understanding that history. You have to go into college and actually take classes or get right. books on that to learn about the, this part of Ameri uh, world history. World history, the way it's taught right now in schools, it starts with uh, ancient history uh, Rome and Roman and Greek civilization, then it's called the Dark Ages, then you go right to the Renaissance and modern Western civilization. So Islamic civilization is blotted out from our history books. All it says is you had a group of Arabs that went and you know, created uh, an empire, and that's it, with their camels. So th that kind of reductionist mentality and teaching is causing a lot of harm in terms of not understanding the world and being very confrontational when it comes to Muslim-majority countries. So I think that's part of why we reacted the way we did to Dr. Jordan Peterson, because he's actually you know, emblematic of you know, the way he spoke, uh, just blotting out the contributions of Muslims. And the contributions of Muslim peoples to, you know, today, we're some of the most generous people. We help refugees, and in fact, one of the questions, what do you think of the Muslim refugees who are imprisoned in USA prison? I don't know about about who's in prison, that's, um, I don't know how many are, but, um, and, and will be sent back to their homes. Is there a branch in your organization to help them? Uh, you might be talking about those who were, uh, you know, uh, detained by Department of Homeland Security uh, and uh, are being uh, returned, they're, they're expelled because of their immigration status. We don't help uh, them per se in terms of cases, but we do deal with the policy and we believe, like, just as the United States welcomed Soviet Jews back in the 70s, and we welcome Ukrainian refugees now, we should be welcoming all refugees. Uh, it will only benefit America, actually. And um, there's this thing called the Great uh, Replacement Theory, as if immigrants are going to repla replace white uh, people in America. It started in Europe talking about refugees there, or not refugees, but really um, uh, ethnic communities of North Africans, Moroccans and Algerians, that they're going to replace white people in Europe, and Europe is going to become Eurabia. And they're saying the same thing about uh, th this conspiracy now is spilled over to the United States, which led to the attacks uh, in Buffalo, in Pittsburgh, in Poway, and in Charleston. That is what we have to be talking about. Um, and, and then get the United States to commit to a policy of welcoming refugees uh, it, you know, from Muslim-majority countries like we do from European uh, places and, and like we did from the Soviet Union. And actually, there was a resettlement program for those refugees and immigrants at that time. We don't have that for Muslim refugees or refugees from Muslim-majority countries. That's the double standard that MPAC is working on to, to fix. Yes. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, otherwise, I have one for you, Salam. Yes. Um, I think 
Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, what the Quran says about um, intra-group, uh, intra-faith relationship. Uh, and there is this beautiful verse that we always kind of use uh, in some uh, multi-faith and interfaith yeah. settings, which is uh, 49.13. 49.13. Oh, people, oh, humanity. So the verse is talking about, is addressing all people, not just Muslims. Mm -hmm. It says, Ya Nas, oh, people, you've been made from a male and a female. Uh, and wait, uh, you came from a male and a female and made into different nations and tribes so that you might come to know one another and learn from each other. Um, the message is not to despise each other, but mm -hmm. to learn from one another. And the best among you is the one who is conscious of God. That's 49.13. Yeah, it's a beautiful verse, and I think it really summarizes uh, lots of the work that lots of Muslim communities have been doing. Uh, there is research in sociology, which is my discipline, uh, that shows how, you know, after 9-11, especially American Muslims have felt very much compelled to engage, uh, to come out in the public sphere, to engage uh, in relationship, not only across religious difference, but in general to be more engaged uh, in civic spaces. Uh, so again, uh, we have data that shows how uh, active the Muslim community in the United States has been uh, to try to bridge the divides. Um, and and um, I wonder, though, uh, again, to kind of get out of this um, idea that ha Muslims have to do the work, which, you know, I'm sure that you agree with that and yeah. you invite your community more to put times to kind of do the work. But what can we as no Muslims do uh, to kind of... Uh, if, if we care about having a functional democracy in which every uh, minority, religious or not, is respected, uh, what, what can we do? I think for communities outside the Muslim community, what we need help in is, you know, uh, if you're Christian, spread the gospel. Uh, spread the word, the good word uh, of the work that's being done. And so the reality on the ground is that Muslims, Christians, Jews, people of all faiths, all Americans are actually working in coexistence, are actually helping one another, protecting each other. That's, that's the reality. What we see in the political sphere and in, you know, in, in social media now is polarization, that it's toxic and is leading to the erosion of our democracy because now people uh, have less confidence of our institutions that are set up for democracy. And once that happens, then there's no democracy and we will fall into authoritarian rule. So um, working, uh, all people working, all like-minded people working for democracy and for mutual understanding should help spread the word for one another. And the Quran says the good word uh, is, is like a good tree. It has strong roots and bear, bears fruit that will sustain people for as long as God wills. The corrupt word is, is like a dead tree. It has no roots and can't sustain anything. So. We believe in the good word. Um, the good word also needs money uh, and people to push the ideas out. So either your time or your money to support initiatives, doesn't have to be impact, could be whatever is happening in your local community. If you believe that they're doing good work, then support it with your time and or your money because that will help save our democracy. And Muslims are working at the forefront uh, in, in protecting our democracy. And as the Declaration of uh, Inde Independence says, we're doing it because of our sacred honor. It's our honor that we must uphold to one another. And the Quran talks about honor that in the terms of uh, human dignity. It says, O children of Adam, God has bestowed human dignity on all of you. And so we must defend it because that is the spirit of God that is breathed into every human being. And that is what we must defend. Yes, and I can, uh, you know, talk on a personal uh, note that uh, MPAC has been very welcoming of me, uh, not being Muslim, and we are always in need of hands uh, to help out. Uh, so probably um, giving you more uh, uh, than that because during Ramadan, 
the Muslims would come and give you cupcakes. Oh, and, yes, they and, feed and me. And they felt sorry that you weren't <laughs> fasting with us, so they gave you more, more goodies. To get more points. Yes. To get, get more points. Like, I would <laughs> doing be us a favor. eating in front of you yeah. all. To get... <laughs> yes, you're doing us a favor since we got more points watching you eat. And Thank enjoy you. watching uh, the foods that come to this office from our non-Muslim <laughs> right. staff. But, but the point being that, you know, lots of Muslim organizations in the country and, and packing, like, especially, is working, are working towards um, issues that are of interest to uh, everyone uh, in the United States. Um, I have attended uh, multiple events that MPAC has organized throughout my year that I've spent here. And, um, you know, I recognized some of the problems that I uh, think are important to address that go beyond uh, being linked simply to the Muslim community. And so I think like um, reconnecting to those shared values, we like if we all want a healthy, sound democracy, if we all want, um, you know, like pluralism to be upheld as a principle and that is, you know, actually uh, practiced and not just preached, uh, then I think we can um, recognize in the work that MPAC is doing beyond uh, simply, um, you know, being Muslim or self-identifying as such. So um, I think that again goes uh, to uh, to how to build this kind of solidarity uh, that is definitely uh, cross, uh, across faiths, tradition, uh, because we work towards something that goes simply beyond uh, mere, um, you know, pursuing uh, Muslim-only interests. The Muslim-only interests are interests that also get, um, are, you know, t totally complementary with uh, the interests of um, American democracy. So uh, that's where we're at. That's why I felt like family. You know? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> it is an Abrahamic family that we try to engender here at MPAC that you know that we're all followers of Abraham whether you're Christian Muslim or Jew and that we're all uh, uh, brothers and sisters in humanity regardless uh, of our background so it's it's a lot like America we you know where we welcome everybody in Amer in America we welcome uh, people from all walks of life and create that tapestry of pluralism that is very enriching not replacing uh, that is additive not competitive it's like the light in the room it's the smallest element in the room, but it's the most powerful and it is the most helpful. It helps us see. And that's what we believe religion should be, that vehicle for people to take us from darkness to light and to bring about uh, a more equitable wor world, a better place for all of us to live. And we welcome anyone from any other walk of life uh, to work with us for that pursuit. Uh, and, um, and this is how we serve God, by by serving humanity. And there's definitely lots of work to do right now. <laughs> there's a lot. American democracy is slightly falling apart. So. Slightly. <laughs> so definitely, Not there yet. <laughs> this is a subtle invitation for everyone, Muslim and Muslims, to come and help out and, uh, and do the work and kind of show to Jordan Peterson how you know, in our everyday professional lives, we are really countering uh, this uh, monolithic idea of, um, you know, Muslims as not engaging in this kind of trans uh, faith work uh, that, you know, you experience here at the office every day. Um, so do we have any last comment for Jordan Peterson? I think that's it. We covered it. You, I think your last comment was perfect. That's perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope to have uh, more informal discussions and conversations like this uh, in the future. Um, and so we'll see you soon.